I used to talk in radio for the blind. Cool. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that was the first thing I did when I was a kid. Yeah. When I was a teenager. But we had very nice equipment for that, so mm. we could have fun with the equipment, really. And DJing and pipe radio, stuff like that. Oh, fun. So I'd done a yeah. few bits and pieces. Yeah, this, um, I, I had this too. First thing, it all helped. Yeah. Like not, you know, suddenly everybody starts running. You can always move down the corridor. No, it'll, it'll be I fine. I think it'll be all right. Yeah, this is, this is yeah. a lot quieter than yeah. the land okay. hotel. But, um, yeah. starting with question one, tell me or tell the, the story of uh, how you first got involved with magic. How I first got involved with magic. That's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I suppose the thing that I don't know if it's true the thing that first pops into my head is that when I was uh, it's just someone said uh, he, he was a, a rock climber there's a friend of mine who was into rock climbing and stuff uh, and this is back in the 70s even and he said he's interested in rock climbing he just read this weird book by this guy called Alistair Crowley mm-hmm. and that m- maybe he said he wasn't sure what to make of it but uh, he thought maybe I should read it for some reason. He said, you should read this. You'll probably get more out of it. And, and, and uh, he said, it wasn't very much about climbing in it. But he said, it's an interesting guy. So maybe I said... So it's just an accidental connection, I suppose, really. Uh, and maybe... So I read that... I can't remember where I read that. Whether I went and read it in the library. I, I come from... Uh, South Wales, mm-hmm. place, quite a redneck place, really. Mm-hmm. Newport, South Wales. So there was quite. Uh, it has a certain mystery to it, I think. You know, if you look for it. Uh, anyway, you wouldn't have think it, but in the middle of who'd have thunk it, as they say, uh, that in the middle of Newport, the town library has quite a good collection. Then, in the nineteen sixties, of occult books, uh, kept in a special cabinet. <laughs> right, a special locked cabinet. I was. I must have been about. Uh, I was still at school. I was still at school, I think. So really, technically, under the age in which you were allowed to access books in the locked cabinet. But I think they worked out because I spent so much time in the library. Right, which I still do. Tend to yeah. Haunt libraries. So I was always in the library. So when I was quite young. So if I asked them for something in the locked cabinet, they'd always give it to me. Uh, so the, I, I ended up, I read Masters and Johnson, right? Mm-hmm. This is, may not seem an obvious occult book, but it sort of is in a way. It's, a, you know, it's about human sexuality, you know sure. what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. it's about exploding myths of sexuality, and it's just a kind of, kind of more rational approach to that sort of stuff. And I read uh, Crowley's Magic and Theory and Practice, which they also both next to each other so those are the two and then you know the usual stuff from that so yeah I think it was just that connection really and then living in quite a spirited place I think mm. although not it, not people wouldn't normally think of it as such because it's very industrial it's, it's very very I live in the I was born really in the most depraved part of the, one of the most depraved cities in Britain Realistically, because I was born in the dock docklands, inner city docklands thing, so it's a very industrial, blasted landscape. But somehow that's quite that's quite magical in a way. The wasteland, it's a waste, sure. it's an industrial wasteland with this hugely powerful ancient river running through the middle of it. 
So it is, it is, yeah, it is like this kind of strange wasteland place in which there are these kind of remnants of some ancient civilization poking through in odd bits. And so this is from a child's point of view then. Mm. Some of those ancient bits are kind of like remnants for then from the Second World War, really. Uh, and old bits of ships, you know, wrecks, shipwrecks and stuff. But the other bits and pieces, bits from the Normans and then bits from the Romans and then bits from the Celts. Uh, so as you kind of gradually, as you move through this landscape, it's, it's just the landscape itself kind of turned me on to it, really, even though it seems so unlikely. But actually, it is quite... Now, they, since, since I moved away, there is quite a big archaeological project in what looks just like mud. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a mud estuary. Which doesn't look like, but actually, from that mud, some of the most important discoveries about the human past have been discovered just there, actually there where I live, in the mud. They dug the mud out and they found. So my, I had an intuition about that, I think, mm -hmm. and that kind of yeah, that got me. So it's the spirit of the place of where I lived, and being a very bookish. I wouldn't say I was a loner. I'm not really a loner, you see. I, I do things by myself, but um, I'm, I, you know, I've always had lots of friends. I've always been very, very lucky with friends and stuff like that. Even, even though that's inner city blues, really. <laughs> <laughs> that's a rough, rough area. Yeah. Uh, but somehow or other, I, I have a sort of maybe a certain charisma then that enables me to kind of relate to people, different sorts of people. I'm always very interested in people's stories, no matter what they're like, or even if they're sort of slightly unusual. So I used to take pe people on my... I go on these journeys, if you like, into the landscape, looking for the, sec the secrets of where I lived, which I thought were there, and take people with me, really. Take you know my friends. Mm. They come with me, so I wasn't always alone. But sometimes I was alone, but it was ju just from that. And then, as I say, this accidental encounter with Crowley, and also Madame Blavatsky, I think, because they had the Blavatskys, you know, the classic things, which is quite hard to. Did you start with Isis Unveiled? I could, I yeah, challenging probably. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't really make very much of it. And you don't know then, do you, right? Whether it's just you being stupid. You read these great big books and you think, oh, maybe it's just me, you know, I'm a bit dim or something. But I can't quite get my head around this. I can't work it out, whether it's true or whatever. So it kind of... I read it, but I kind of suppose it sent me on another journey to try and get the capacity to work out whether that was... whether some of these things were true or not. Uh, so this is why, you know, books and studying has always been quite an important part of my journey in some ways. I've never been at a kind... I always have to check things. I'm quite sceptical frame of mind, really. This has always got me in trouble. I mean, I've, I've always been a religious person, I suppose, but not in a, not in a very conventional way. So I have this sort of mystical... Experiences, but they've got, as they, so that means I've kind of encountered lots of different religions at the same time. But I often get into trouble because, say, with the Christians, go through a kind of I have quite a good experience with experience with that. I don't buy into all the cultural crap, but as an experience, it was it was fun. You know, it was good. It was a real mystical experience I had with them. But then they want you to they want you to study, don't they? They want you to read the Bible in these little groups and everything like that. And they and but then I turn up with a with a book of my own, you know. Say, oh, well, this this is about a book about that, you know, like a commentary or something. And they hated that sort of stuff. <laughs> they don't like you. They want they they don't like you to kind of look approach their stuff that way. They want you to. So they got rid of me, I think, really. I know, as I say, they, they were quite part, a good part of the journey. They used to, the, there was the Bible thing, but they liked, they were very into the outdoors. You know, I'm a very city person, so actually the countryside and the mountains very strange to me, really. 
you know, I needed to be initiated into that. I needed to be taken. They, they, they did do that. They took me up into the in little parties of us up from the city, oiks from the city. So yeah. you take the oiks from the city into the countryside and see if they can be transformed by the landscape, which to some extent you are. It's true, it works. Not quite as they would have wanted, maybe. But um, so from those sort of yeah, I have a religious approach to uh, magic, I think it's true. I know a lot of people in this tradition don't, they don't always like to talk about uh, religious stuff. But if I'm honest about it, uh, I kind of think that's probably always been a part, you know, has always been part of my personality, really. Not that we have any religious background in our family. Being an inner city family is completely fractured. Mm. Uh, split family so it's not like the traditional stuff people are divorced and don't live together and they don't do any of the things you're supposed to do as families so but and they don't so that means they don't really believe in the church or anything like that they don't like any of that but they kind of have their you know like my mother who's gone now but she always say well I'm kind to animals that's my religion as far as I'm concerned, that, that's all I care. If I'm kind to creation to animals, that's, that should all that should matter, as far as you can see. I don't need to know anything else. It's quite so things like that. So, um, <clears throat> uh, an inner city childhood that you said was quite intuitive uh, and sort of exploring the, the layers of landscape underneath it. Would you say then, if you uh, weren't raised in a religious house, were you raised in a house of high strangeness? Was the house haunted? Did the family have traditions of these kind of things? Any kind of um, odd experiences as an intuitive child growing up in a landscape like that? We didn't live in anywhere special, right? We lived in the classic slum. Hmm. As you know, there's a book called The Classic Slum, right? It's not actually written about Newport, but it's, it is essentially it's the inner city slums. They're not particularly special. Uh, <clears throat> but, yeah, I, uh, they're not... There's certainly open minds about it. There's always plenty of books in the house, you know, even though we're not... My parents never went to university and I think they kind of always thought that books were important and that we should be reading weird things and my mother always took me to the library every week uh, to get books and she'd go and get her Frank Yerby <laughs> romances and the library was a very spooky library if you know what I mean very mystical very like an M.R. James sort of building if you know what I mean sort of Victorian dark sort of ghostly place full of weird books so she'd get her books and then I'd, I'd go and get totally inappropriate books really for my age you know Sigmund Freud and stuff like that and uh, <clears throat> librarian saying are you sure he, sure he should be sure it's the right sort of book for him shouldn't he have a kid's book oh see, see look at it oh it looks interesting yeah if he wants it why not I'd let him have it you know to which you do so there were bit, so, so spooky things like libraries I uh, I think I was probably quite disturbed really as a child <laughs> <laughs> realistically there were lots of things that made me quite uh, unsettled even, I, I have to admit, right, even now, I'm comple completely pra plagued by nightmares. Hmm. Uh, I always have been all of my life. I'm just more used to it now than ever before. So, if, um, you know, I just, but, but yes, yeah, yeah, it becomes more interesting as you get into magic and stuff, you know, that to have so many weird dreams. But particularly when I was a child, I was very, very plagued by um, uh Nightmares, and I was always waking up and seeing things in the room and stuff. Some of it I understand now what it was. I was good at, um, I suppose you'd call it scrying, really. You know, you sort of lying in bed, not quite asleep, and you sort of see shapes, make shapes out of things, and then you kind of, you know, it's, it becomes frightening. So I was always seeing things coming out of the wall and having to, uh, yeah, just screaming the place down, basically. Uh, 
I mean, her parents were okay about it, you know, really. They didn't they sort of say, oh, well, you just... I always felt very safe for my parents. That was the only thing. If you're going to do, you know, we, we all end up, do, we all start doing magic in the parents' house, don't we? Right? At some point. You just do, right? Uh, and it's, it's actually quite a safe place. It's not for everybody, right? But in my case, it was. And for a lot of people, it's actually quite magically, psychologically, quite a safe place, the, the parents' house. I think we kind of underestimate that as our first magical temple really is the parents house because they uh, your protectors ideally so whatever happens in your magical experimentation this kind of part of you thinks well I can always shout for my parents and the old man will come in and sort it all out you know and, and this sort of that's quite reassuring well, I think it's true and I think that's even now in um I think the first landscape that you live in, and uh, which includes your parents' house and the places that they live, it, it's it's still there. It lives in your in your psyche, really. And you quite often, even though you have different experiences, you quite often go back to that place in your dreams or in your psychology, in your thoughts, in your visions. So even if I was, say, thinking about whether a little person who became a guru of mine later on, Tadaji, I'll, I'll meet him in, back in this landscape mm. somewhere. I'll be walking across some in ruined factory, and I'll meet him there sitting in his... What's, so it's, 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 I think it's best not to resist it. I yeah. think it's best to, to accept that that's, that's going to be... That landscape's going to keep living in your, your head, and it's actually quite useful... <clears throat> to you, so yeah, that that's so they're very open-minded to that. They didn't uh, particularly indoctrinate me religiously. Um, they're actually quite, in, in, you know, over the years as I became interested in magic, they, you know, did the tarot. They'd asked me to do the tarot for them, really. Or when my mother, she wanted to, there was a house she really wanted. To, they live, we didn't live in that area forever. We moved to another district, which had a sort of nice bungalow on it, you know, the sort of dream. And uh, she always wanted to live in this bungalow. And uh, the funny thing, the funny thing was about this place where she was on the bungalow. In my journey, and as a when I was from about ten years old, really, I was always going for walks, quite long distances. I'd gone to this. Iron Age fort up on the hill in the middle of a housing estate really you walk through the housing estate and on the hill there's a remains of an Iron Age fort in a, a forest so I knew the area incredibly well because I'd sort of wandered all over it I mean we used to, we had to walk along the railway lines <laughs> right, to get there right? there was no health and safety then so she said oh, so I really want a house there you know, this is a dream. That's my final house, sort of thing. It wasn't not massive or anything, but it's just wanted to be there. She said, and I thought, oh, yeah. She said, you're into all this magic stuff and everything. Do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I don't need the money, but she said, we got the money. Just get me the house because uh, we want to be. We want to live there. It's not particularly, you know, outrageous. So. So there was a sort of understanding uh, that you know that that's what we, that's the sort of that that's what we did, really. And they'd always say, "Oh yeah, well, of course, the people in the family used to." We're not we're not <coughs> uh, hostile to that sort of stuff. Or as you say, you say the thing you got Lord Tradiga, right? You know, there's this book, hasn't it, just been published about. Morgan, he's Morgan's own Morgan, yeah. is he? <laughs> <coughs> the last sky on the scion of the House of Tredega. It's a coal baron family that's got a big grand house outside Newport that Crowley used to go and visit, you see. I didn't know that. Yeah, if you read, uh, they've just published a little book about it. It's not a lot of information, but he, he was, they say, he was the mad, last mad person in the family. So it was quite a great family in his time. They were all that. Uh, you know, the stuff of whatever it is, Charles of the Light Brigade and all the horses from Charles of the Light Brigade are buried there and things like that. Really? It's quite a history, but, but then he went a bit 
He was eccentric, and Crowley was a regular visitor there. So there's this that place with a connection. You know, it's a data so of course, Crash Band Wallet. I used to work there when I was a kid. Oh, really? And he said, uh, he said, when they were like laying the pipes, the Irish man came over, because lots of Irish people there, and they couldn't find the sewer uh, across the part line we're seeing he to get to. So the Irish man, he said, he, yeah, he just went and found it. He doused for it. And he said they, must, they did find it because it cost them a lot of money to dig up the whole thing. The whole thing. And then they, they had to do it. So he said, yeah, of course, they can do that. That's very interesting. So there's sort of not huge, but there's, there's a connection. There certainly, is. You know. So does that mean that your first, <laughs> uh, first instances of ritual magic were Crowleyan and out of magic and theory and practice that you got from Newport Library? Yeah. Was that the first yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, probably was. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. It, it may well have been. <laughs> Most of the people I've spoken to so far, it's been uh, mastering. Well, what else would there be? Know, exactly. yeah. Are you were just talking about um, doing these things, and I have the exact same... Um, I, I understand entirely what you mean about the parents' house as that sort of first safe temple. Yeah. Um, and especially as you get older and you have those additional windows of time where they realise they can leave you alone in the house while uh. they go and do something for an hour and you sort of grab your things and, uh, and go for it. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah, um, That's a first for Crowley. Most people, it's been mastering witchcraft, always from libraries. Mm. Uh, very interesting. So after that, I mean, if that's sort of, let's say, mid-high school, was it... Um, love at first sight with this idea of personal mysticism? I mean, where did, did you decide at that point in time you were going to be a Thelemite and, and, and carry on? Uh, a bit of a slow developer, really. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, no, it's all right. If you do, I reckon that back then, I don't know if it worked now, but if you took his yoga exercises... Uh, the yoga stuff, even though it's a little bit wrong-headed in some ways, isn't it? I think now, now looking back, people don't don't rate that stuff so, as much. Uh, but but yeah, no, I can, the the basic stuff is there, isn't it? The uh, less lesser ritual, the pentagram, and the, the yoga. Yeah. And uh, from the yoga, I had a mystical experience from that, really. In, in my parents' house, realistically, yeah, truly, which kind of was quite scary. It, it, it yeah. was very scary because you're not really expecting that. Maybe if you had a teacher or something, they might kind of either they tell you and that will put you off, not put you off. It would. It, maybe it's the fact of you have to be doing it in a kind of slightly winging it a bit before you that happens to you. Yeah. If you were in a more controlled environment, maybe it wouldn't happen. <laughs> See, my memory... But, yeah, my but memory, it does work, you know. It, well, it does, yeah. and I, I kind of know what you mean, because my first few instances, I wasn't sure which thing I was uh, expecting, either absolutely nothing on the one hand, or mm. genuine dragons landing, full visible mm. appearance. And I got neither. I got something in the middle, and it was quite eerie, where you suddenly realise, ooh... I was not expecting this. This this works in some way, and you are on your own, sort of poking at the, the edges of reality, and it, 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 it pokes back, and it's a bit odd. Uh, yeah, no, that was a breakthrough. I wasn't expecting it, and it, but it was real. Yes, uh, but quite frightening. So. And you don't know what to do, do you? You don't know whether you're just supposed to persevere and that they might, but you don't know if you're going to survive it, really. It sounds a bit dramatic, <laughs> really, but you've got no real compass for that. No. But it is good, that's what you want. You want that kind of um, validation in a way. That's the sort of indication that there's, uh, this is, there is something there. There is a kind of, it does work. Well, so yeah, as you were saying, mm. if you got if you were reading uh, Blavatsky and Crowley almost contemporaneously, in both cases, a lot of it would have gone over your head, or at least it did mm. for me. But in the case of Crowley, um, you say, well, a lot of this has gone over my head. However, it does have pictures and and steps like a cookbook, 
And I, I think on the other side of going through these steps, there might be a different understanding. It was still wrong. It took me years to get even my head around Koei in, in the slightest, but that was, that was different to reading uh, other mystical stuff where you go, this is over my head, but it does have this cookbook section of mispronounce these Hebrew words in this direction and, and see what happens. Mm. And, uh, Plus, I don't know about you, but... The, that edition of um, Magic and Zoom Practice, the one that uh, the one that Kenneth Grant and John Simons edited, which is, I know is very controversial for some, but the thing I really liked about it was the, that colour cover. Mm. It's very evocative, I thought. Yeah. It's a beautiful cover, and it's quite a, quite a strange, mystical... I mean, that was the first thing that I ever spotted about when that was when I was back in the the reference library or the local library and they were doing the books that was the first thing you spot is that sigil on the front of that book it really draws you in and you think I've got that's that's, that's actually quite spooky like. it's, it's quite yeah. a spooky sigil yeah it yeah. should be that yeah. it really grabs you and I think with the later editions they haven't quite got something quite as powerful as that on the cover with the mm. other new editions that's so that book is always quite special for that reason. But then, the, yeah, that, so that aspect of the book as well, the, the diagrams and that was... And the colour, the colour symbolism of it, because we've always been quite visual in our family, really. My, uh, <coughs> we're always quite... Maybe we're not magical, but we're quite... Art, my, uh, my mother's quite mathematical, quite reasoning, you see. My father's very visual likes to paint and draw and stuff like that and understands the sort of uh, science of colour uh, self trained so the, but you can see that that's, he's right there that those colour you'd see it, I show it to him he said oh yeah well I can tell you why that's making you feel funny mm, he nice. said because that, those colours there are kind of uh, responding to each other they're doing something weird to your head mm. he said that's quite clever really <laughs> I um, I also quite like that your entry into Crowley was via rock slash mountain climbing. I think that uh, I think he would approve. Uh, Not that I was ever any. I could never. I was pretty <laughs> no, crap I think, at that. I think you'd quite like that. I think, you know. I'd love to do that. Yeah, wouldn't you? People, I think that would be the wonderful thing to do. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, next lifetime, my goodness. Uh, after that, so. Um, after leaving home, I mean, from that first taste, was it, OK, I'm going to practice magic regularly? I didn't you... leave home. My parents left home. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, at last they did. <laughs> <laughs> they moved into their new bungalow. Oh, I see. Yeah. If you like. And was that, I mean, I, I'm just trying to, to track after encountering Crowley, which direction, what happens? Because if you look at, say, um, the <clears throat> subsequent published work, um, you had quite a wide range of... Um, spiritual and occult experiences so we're just trying to get an idea of that so then well then what do you do you read Crowley you want to join his order don't you it's a sort of natural thing you want to find the people mentioned in the books you know it's the, the, in, in the whatever it might be the OTO or the AA or something so and then uh, so yeah I went and looked for them uh, and I can't it was just a weird thing, really. You, you know, the, I bought the tarot deck, you know, the Crowley tarot deck in one of the first editions, and there was an address in that, which I wrote to, but I didn't get a reply from... The reply... You'd think the reply then would come from the... What, what, I don't know what term we want to use for, for the, the, the Caliphate OTO, because I would have thought the address on that must be the Caliphate OTO back then. But in fact, I got contacted by, from America by people in the Typhonian OTO. Hmm. So you, I can't explain that. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, uh, I had a, they get a mentor, I don't know, you get your mentor from some guy who was in the American military based in a, a forward base in South Korea, I suppose could be on the border with you know wow and because i don't think they have much to do well, i don't know right? yeah. so i spent all the time <laughs> writing letters <laughs> teenager cultists yeah. <laughs> yeah. he was all right yeah. so he said that he was going to correspond with me 
because there was nobody able in or nobody available in Britain at the time who could so there's nobody more local could do it here you know so I ended up in a magical group uh, sort of not particularly no th- mixed thalamic kind of witchcrafty type thing really doing our own thing and there was a guy who probably I shouldn't name <laughs> <laughs> We used to work together, yeah. uh, a couple of us, and he was a sort of associate member of the Caliphate in America. So they uh, they weren't, uh, that's all there was, they weren't activated. Right. But very, very soon then, about this, almost as soon as I met him, he was activated, right? Or <laughs> that network suddenly activated, it got to a critical mass or something, I don't know what happened. And it, that's... That's the beginning, really, of the re, of the caliphate redux, or right. whatever. I suppose it kind of re re came back to life again, yeah. didn't it? Really, in some sense. But in, in the meantime, you were uh, getting dispatches from a war zone on Libra Resh, and, and uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of uh, yeah, uh, someone in the American military. Uh, near no man's land, writing to this Welsh kid about the I know, Rush. yeah, that's, before that's really computers cool. and everything, yeah. it's all handwritten. <laughs> Watching the world to see if there's going to be a nuclear bomb that yeah. night. That's <laughs> <laughs> so, as we said, that's literally what it was watching for an attack, monitoring whatever they monitor to see if there's going to be war. Wow. So, that was, I mean, I didn't know that was quite fun. But I suppose all those different threads came together. I mean, let's say if you think about Blavatsky, Blavatsky stuff. Again, and Crowley, it sort of introduces all these systems. There's a sort of combination of, of Indian mysticism with Egyptian mysticism, really. They seem to sort of overlap, don't they? Certainly Blavatsky. There's some, quite a lot of Indian tantric material. And then a lot of this stuff from the Middle East and whatever, it moves from one to the other. That's what makes it quite confusing at times. But it's, uh, somehow or other, it kind of gives you this idea of another of the secrets of the land of Eastern promise, yeah. which is uh, India and uh, the tantric system. And in fact, it's been that connection that had detonated, not detonated, but it caused a, a row within the Typhonian, really, that kind of put them back a little bit, I think, because one of the people in that organisation decided that really that's what he wanted mm. that that was the message of, that for him that was the message of Crowley Crowley was saying go east wasn't he you know he was saying that's don't bother with all that that's, that, there's a, that's an interesting it's all there I mean it is isn't it he starts off with yoga and all this stuff he's, he's, he's saying that's that's a very important stream of the of mysteries so that kind of I suppose I was always kind of, that got me interested in the Eastern stuff. I was interested from reading Blavatsky and before that, interested in Hinduism and stuff from quite early on. So I could see the, that that was uh, an important dispensation to go for, really. And I don't know if you know that in the ni- that's when in the 1970s, there's all these people are mixed up. They had this magazine co- that the Typhonian was doing called Sothis, and then this Indian guru. Apparently, an Indian guru, as far as I knew, is an Indian guru. Uh, but he has a weird history, as you know. Uh, started writing to this UK occult magazine, of all the magazines he could have written to, saying he was quite interested in Crowley uh, and that he'd like to write articles for the magazine about Hindu mysticism, but a more occult version of it, more sort of specifically tantric. So that was. That, that was very tantalising. That kind of I was sort of, sort of quite interested in that. That was because he had that uh, the first article. There was an article called "The Dragon Seat," I think, which is probably the best best thing for Dadaji, which is just a very, again a very simple meditation based on from the Hindu tradition of building this circle when you're the sort of master of dragons who sits in the centre, the dragon lords. Mm. I should say, right, when, when I was back in Wales, why that struck me as being interesting is when I, when I was back in Wales and on the search, you know, still a teenager, I went to this farmhouse uh, up one of the valleys with a friend who was a, a 
pre Christian priest really, and he, but he was very indulgent. He was all right. He was a friend. He was a good friend. And uh, but I suppose he thought if he showed me what a load of nonsense it was, I might kind of get me through it. So he took me to see this astrologer friend of his who lived on a farm in the middle of nowhere. And you know, it didn't have the effect. it was an amazing connection. She was really, really good. So she um, cast my horoscope. And so she said, oh, ask, and did some other things. The eating, eating. Mm, really she said, oh, I know the eating. She said, cast eating. She said, oh, what, what do you want to know? And, um, I said, oh, well, I want to know, you know, where I'm going to go magically. What's my magical path? I didn't, maybe didn't put it like that. She so cast eating, and it comes up with the hexagram. She said, oh, I know what that means. She says, it's the six dragons. Uh, you've got six six dragons ascending to heaven. <laughs> I said, oh, well, that sounds... But then, you know, if you think about it, six dragons ascending to heaven is the seal of Amukos. And uh, they're known as the dragon lords. You know, so they have all this completely pretentious, crazy stuff, really. But, you know, it was a good coincidence. It was good. So it just seemed right when I read that about the magic of the dragon seat and the dragon lords of Amukos and stuff like that. I know you think it's all kind of no, I like occult that. flim flam. No, it's not. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've done dragon magic in Wales quite recently. I, I well, there you go. Know. So, yeah. And, yeah, and we come from Wales, and so mm. is the dragon. Exactly. Uh, it makes complete sense uh, that we should be the dragon lords. <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> because we are. I went to Vortigern's Tower um, late last year and, and did the Hoofa spell in Welsh. So. Um, that was impressive. But, well, but, uh, yeah, whales and dragons, it runs deep. You've got, you've yeah. got, there, go, go for it. You, <laughs> you're right, that's your, you forget your ancestry, it's, it's there, yeah. it's true. That's what I say, I'm a Morgan, or Morgan, I know there's billions of Morgans in Wales, but they are mythical creatures, aren't they, the Morgans? They're creatures from the sea. Mm. They're sort of quite strange, mystical combination. They're sea creatures, they're sea creatures that bred with the people of Wales at some point. There you go. <laughs> and also <laughs> gave us famous pirates, you know. <laughs> the pirates, yes, mm -hmm. very, we all, that's the old man always used to say we were related to the pirate, to Captain Morgan. Good. <laughs> but see, I, but I, see I, everybody I, is, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Wales, I mean, and also, I mean, I think, I, I called it Britain's Tibet, because I, I, I love the place, I go there all the time. Um, you're all weird, you're all kind of... Um, what what Hollywood thinks the Irish are like, the Welsh are actually like. They're all mm. kind of half psychic. Getting, oh, well, it's very you know. nice of you to say <laughs> that. I like that a lot. That's good. Yeah. No, I go for that. Anyway, so that was all those weird sort of synchronicities that. So it just seemed right that I should do the Amukos thing, really. Even though, yeah, it's not quite completely natural. But it is, yeah, it's a Crowley thing, isn't it? Tantra mm. stuff. It's the, it's the connection it needs. Agreed. You know, I have a, I do a historical connection. I do a lot of uh, mantra stuff and what have you. It's um, as someone commented on the blog um, last year. I forget who. Inevitably, all chaos people end up in the mukos. Uh, which, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Uh, but you also have the fact that um, a, a lot of these uh, thought forms, ideas, and words are at the bottom of the Indo-European language tree. Mm. So um, it's almost like without co-opting anyone on the way it's almost like taking uh, you you have another claim of uh, of authenticity or sort of cultural attachment to it as long as you skip a couple of civilizations just sort of jump them and mm -hmm. land there these um, these ideas sit at the bottom of the the language tree that uh, runs throughout uh, Europe so I, I find getting into it that way um, has worked for me mm -hmm. rather than that sort of uh, you're always aware of the, the ridiculousness of that um, high Victorian dressing in saris and and, what, and, and wandering around Landbrook Grove, and it's <laughs> <laughs> you're always sort of faintly aware. Like I hope I, I hope that's not how this is coming off, and uh, and I I have justified it to myself on on a linguistic basis. Right. Hmm. So the Amukas thing started um, fairly recently after. So go to the Mukos thing when that caused trouble mm. with the uh, OTO. Right. Well, you know, with the OTO I was in, I think, one way or another. Because I probably got involved in a 
because there was bad feeling about something. I don't, you know, I don't know what all there's bad feet because you've got the Kenneth Grant thing, and then you've got his star pupil, if you like, his designated successor, really. That's how it was seen at the time. Uh, but then he's gone off somewhere else, really. He's gone off on an, his own journey. Uh, so I think Kenneth Grant probably took that quite badly. Plus, neither side acted well in that, I don't think, realistically. People are not. I am a diplomat, as people usually say. I'm much more diplomatic about everything. People, not everybody's as diplomatic as I am. Sometimes <laughs> they say things they don't realise how hurtful it might be um, to someone who's sort of struggled and built up something. You know, it's like magic is a very personal thing, I suppose. You're working with people, and then it's like it's always the same with groups and everything. When people, it's always a difficult moment when you have to leave that group. Yes. You know, it's because you've done, you've shared a lot with those people, and you know you've you've revealed a lot. They've revealed a lot about themselves, and you've had certain experiences. And but then they're going to walk away from it. They have to. It's such a common thing, and how you handle it like that. It can be handled really badly, or it can be handled well. And you know, in those circumstances, people don't always have to. It's like divorce or something; they don't know how to do it. There's a way of doing it without sort of killing each other, you know. But uh, sometimes you just don't have the skill to do that. But right away, people can be very clever writing books and everything, but they might not have the emotional intelligence to know how you how you handle it or realize how painful this is going to be to someone. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes someone to make a new friend, really. It's human nature, isn't it? You, mm. know, you, don't, you want them to be your friend. You don't want them to go off on one. I mean, it's the same. Crowley's the same. He hated people doing that sort of thing. Yeah, even though he did it, that's fine. And he did it himself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's the so that, that, had caught that so basically they didn't handle that very well, and they wrote, went into print and did all sorts of, said all sorts of things they shouldn't. Without realising, because you don't realise anybody's going to notice, do you? You don't expect anybody to read anything that some, you know, obscure occultist might have written in some fanzine. But it does get, word gets around, you know, you have to, it, people, it's a small world, people do hear things. And, and, they, and they, it, it hurts them and they, huh. so that, I think that caused a lot of, um, Problems with between Amukos and uh, Typhonian, really, and th that's not the only time that's happened. Other groups have found it difficult. Uh, you know, they would have a natural affinity with each other, and they ought to be able to work together, but don't seem to be able to do it. Uh, you know, there's a power struggle, or there's this ego thing. So it's the same with e uh, Andrew Chumley or all this sort of stuff, and would be natural fit for. Kind of Grant's person or something like that, but then uh, it ruffles feathers. Mm. As you say, it's quite uh, it's quite personal, and it's it's an odd thing to uh, try and fit things that that clearly have a natural affinity together, um, and and more can go wrong than can go right, as inevitably um, has been borne out over the last hundred and twenty years of sort of Western magical orders. Exactly. So it's, it goes with the territory, you can't avoid it, I suppose. But I happen to come and be stuck right in the middle of that. So as a result of which, it was probably something to do with why I was uh, expelled from that group mm. in the end. Even though I don't really think... Okay, I find it quite difficult to understand why, but I, I, I just was a, probably a, realistically a casualty of, of that sort of stuff, really, of splits and God knows what. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably not. Uh, probably they should have listened to me. Yeah. Sometimes you yeah. feel like saying, "Look, I kind of you're very clever and everything, but I kind of know more about this aspect of things than you you do. I'm gotcha. more experienced when it comes to people and emotions than probably you realise. And I can see that you're this is not going to go well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm not. That's it. I was glad actually to get out of that organisation. I used to make me hypertensive, to be honest. <laughs> it's not what you want. It's not in the time. I don't feel good about it, you know. As I say, I've said that before. I know you that when these letters used to arrive 
from the from whoever it was. You know, you recognise this letter plopping down, and you just have this sinking feeling. You know, it's one of those letters you don't want to open. Yeah. Because you know it's not going to it's going to be negative. <laughs> so, yeah. and then after all that, did you just go rogue and say that's it? I'm doing my own thing now. Did you? Well, no. I was involved in all costs for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and still, kind of slightly, I still got some role in that. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> no, because because no, nobody. I'm because I'm so free and easy. Really, so I think you retain some. So people I keep coming and asking me to do things because they know I'm a pushover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, because I'm kind of more, I don't know. But are you I'm not hard work. I'm not hard work in that way. You know, if someone seems to have their heart in the right place. Mm. I think it's better if you want organisations. If you want a current, I don't care about the organisation. If you want us, I do care about that material. I, 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 I love that it. material and I want it to continue and people to practice it and, and people to understand it and stuff. And I have a great affection for India and, uh, and their philosophy and things. So I want people to engage with it. Sure. So if someone wants to engage with it, my natural thing is, yeah, well, as long as they're not horrible, then let it, let it happen. Don't put obstacles in their way. But also, I, it's a, I don't know if you want to go into that, but it's a whole issue. It's a difficult issue, Tantra, mm. in, the, in, in its relationship to the occult world. We have all these kind of ideas built up about group work and everything, but it doesn't quite fit. Nobody can make that mystery work in the West, apart from certain aspects of it you can. But in your cult session, I think it's problematic. It's, it's complicated why that is. But it doesn't mean it's a lost thing, but maybe the, the, old, the idea of a kind of um, magic, of putting the old um, Golden Dawn Masonic structure on top of that probably is not, not correct, yeah. not right. Have the grades and lodges and stuff. I don't think that uh, I, I don't think that that way has worked. Uh, you know, so I don't think I've found the formula for that yet. I mean, the sort of magic I do, I don't know if they'd like that much either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, speaking of that, would you describe uh, your contemporary practices? Uh, a mookish. Oh God! Well, I think it is right, yeah. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure if any. I don't know if anybody agree. You know. Yeah. I think I, I think it's I think it's the I think it's in the spirit of that cool. stuff, but uh, I think. Uh, uh, it's complete, you know. It might take a while to persuade people of that, but certainly the people in the at the moment. No, no, it depends. It depends. I don't, I don't know. Certainly, the ones I know locally and everything. That's not quite. They're not quite on that. Either, either my vision of it. But I think it is because, well, certainly it's occult, occultism. Blavatsky. It was always east-west. Yes. That was a Mukos concept. The east-west tradition. So the com- the combination of um, the best bit of Western esotericism with uh, Eastern mysteries as well. It just happens I've kind of gone more towards the... I've just been led more into the Egyptian material, really. But I'm looking, to, you know, I'm looking for... You know, the... the, the Aspects of it that would probably wouldn't be distinct. I, I think the type of Egyptian magic I, I, I have just, I'm drawn to, or uh, it is not really that you can't really distinguish it very much from tantrism. No, well, but it wouldn't be what people maybe they wouldn't recognise it as necessarily as tantrism at first. Ghosts and spirits and ghost riding, right? And, and, you see, all the time I've been involved in magic, that, in a sense, that aspect of magic, tra- uh, channeling, trance work, ghost riding, within the crow, it's not really been 
very common, is it? It's not. It's not really thought of as being the way it's supposed to be. No, that surprises me. But yeah, he did not care for channeling and, and the rest of it, did he? Did not care for it. He was very hostile to that, but uh, but then he was sort of doing it. He, wasn't well, he? I mean, <laughs> the book of the law is and, some you know, very you famous sort of writing. There's no other way to. Yeah, it. well, that's right. And the other stuff is all full of channeled stuff yeah. and whatever. But obviously, he, he, but it's but it's like people in a lunatic asylum or something. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they say I'm Napoleon and you're not yeah. Napoleon. But there, there's also um, <laughs> everyone has to. Yeah, exactly. I'm not crazy. He's crazy. You have that Edwardian hierarchy of oh, spiritualism is some is, is womanish, and and people do that in the suburbs and and whatever. It's uh, um, it's it, it's this silly little holdover. Whereas magic, that's good. That's you know we're, we're cutting. That, out. Uh, yeah, I, I see. That's a good example of where I think Crowley. Yeah, that's a mis- he's misled people there. Yes, it's the people have thrown out the baby with the bathwater. Mm-hmm. Yes, you've got to be careful about the bullshit and all that sort of stuff, especially the Victor. But the idea of seances is not such a bad idea. I, I couldn't right? agree more. Right? You know, I think we need to develop those skills. Uh, as a result of which, people are a bit... They do, they do your rituals. You've got quite elaborate ritual structure, but people are too embarrassed to actually do the spiritual bit of it. You know, the... Trancy bit or the channeling and everything, so it's missing. It's often missing from the ritual because people don't feel comfortable about mm. having that in the ritual, and it ought to be there. I, I, that is music to me. As I, mm. I agree completely, and I actually sort of hope that there's a cultural turning point in the next fifteen months where people, um, even unfashionable things like Ouija boards, I, I want to see. Yeah, people, absolutely. I use mine all the time. I'm not going to lie. I, know, I think I think people should be open-minded and. Yeah. Let's say we've been kind of slightly inoculated against that because of the Crowleys was, was such, you know, took the piss out of it so much, and you know people remembered that. But we need to, we need those skills, I think. That's, and yeah, you're right. It's probably coming in from other areas now, isn't it? Which are, are more ecstatic, and it, it, like the voodoo and well, stuff like yeah, that. that um that it's been a of nice sort of reintroduction of just put it in different words, but essentially that's. And the music, as say, people. The other aspect, people forget that even Crowley stuff had music in it. Mm. They think that's incidental, but mm. so you haven't have rit- rituals where they don't have a musical component, but it. it should be there. Yeah, and that's the static stuff, which is what I like about the Islamic sorcery. Is that there's that static musical tradition there. Mm. Which is like, which, as I say, it's that, which is not unlikely. You've got the the stuff you get in voodoo. It was pointed out to me the other day by this anthropologist. Said, "Yeah, you may notice voodoo. They're uh, ridden, aren't they, by the, the spirits? But they're also in the Islamic tradition, which is also very on it. Really, they're they're ghost ridden. They're ridden by ghosts. They're also horses. It says they're horses of the czar." The, the spirit mediums are literally horses being ridden by spirits, and I don't think there's any connection between the two traditions. It's just, it's no, just ma- that's the way magic kind of in the end. If you, when it, that's how, that's how it works. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I don't think there's um, you couldn't make a parent-child uh, relationship between the two. But it is that is the shape of magic. So inevitably, different traditions will find it and call it the same thing. So we we need to get that back, and I I suppose that's connected with what I think about uh, Mukos as well. It needs to do more of that. Mm-hmm. It needs more music, more music and ecstasy, dancing. But we're too see, intellectual. So you say we're too old and, and too intellectual. Yeah. See, you say music <laughs> and ecstasy, and I just think of my um, baby chaos magic days in the mid to late nineties of taking ecstasy and going to you know, progressive trance parties and invoking Dionysus and then having memory loss. <laughs> it's yeah. probably not what you mean, but you just said well, why music not? and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. music and ecstasy. And I'm like, oh, I don't have a memory of that. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, very good points. Um, in terms of... So, I mean, how long were you in Wales? Did you, is it, did you go Wales to Oxford or have you lived in Iceland? You know, just throwing that one out there. Well, I lived in Wales. I say my parents left. To their house, mm-hmm. so I just took over the house and I lived there for another five years. Rented, you know, just 
bought it. In fact, you could buy a house and bugger all, really. Um, and lived there, and then I worked... was very involved in politics for a while. And then I, I kind of felt that I, I did need to spend some time, hit the books, really, do some thinking and studying and stuff like that. So I, I just, yeah... I went to university, so that's when I moved out. In fact, the trade union movement helped me go to university. Mm-hmm. They kind of, I got a scholarship and stuff like that from them. Um, and so I went to Brighton, and then I came here. And in fact, this is a place I always wanted to be. When I was a, in one of those periods when I was a teenager, being lonely and moody, angst-ridden, you know, go on a school trip to Oxford City because I'd be on the school trip and for one reason or another no, absolutely nobody on the bus would speak to me. Right? Everybody, I was being ignored by the entire, my entire class, you know, which is another story because of some, I don't know if I should say this, because there was a bloke, there was a guy who was just a very fond of me, right? This is all right, but we sort of split up. So his revenge was to go, and go back to school, right, and turn the entire school against. But you know, I just, I didn't, I knew it wouldn't last. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't, wasn't so bad. I was prepared. I've been completely used to dealing with things like that. I don't care. I know I can go through it, and that it will be all right in the end. And just do some together. So I come to Oxford, and because they all go up, and so it's an advantage for So I don't wander in Oxford by myself. A lot, and uh, wandered just around here and into the back alley of around the back of the Ashmolean. You wouldn't think it, and and walked into the Oriental Institute. I was about fifteen, and thought, "Oh well, that's just, I'll be back." Mm. Nice. <laughs> Somehow, yeah. I just knew I would. You yeah. know, it just seemed such a unusual. And I did, uh, so I, that was always in my mind that I wanted to go back. So. Then I came here. Yeah. So that's how I got out of Wales, really. <laughs> how we escaped. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I have yeah. considerable geographical jealousy. I, this is such a cool town. Yeah, I, it's not bad. Yeah, I always yeah. wanted to... I miss the sea. That's the sure. only thing that the disadvantage of this place is that it's, you couldn't get further from the sea. No. And that is really something in, that's good for you, good for the soul, really. To go to the sea sometimes. So, um, tell me your publishing story. God, do you really want to know that? Yeah, well, I like <laughs> a short version. I don't, I don't need to know like prices. You better show me the show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, when I I wanted to write I had these ideas and wanted to write about them, but nobody else had published them. Uh, because you know back then it was all element and aquarium press and stuff like that and, and all right it was probably a bit crap but uh, not very good but even so they weren't really interested in that sort of stuff and same with friends you know people, people like Cheska Cheska Potter she had ideas that nobody would do anything with mm. uh, so it just yeah there's opportunities sure to because it's quite a left-wing place, actually. You wouldn't think it. It's quite a quite alternative community here. There's lots of facilities to do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do in some of the local businesses. They're quite into uh, providing facilities for people to uh, get their ideas out who would normally be not be allowed to, hmm. right? Left-wing groups, usually, p- political things, women's groups, gay groups, anybody who's got a message... That you see, you know, I take, it's, it wouldn't happen now. But I've taken in the time of taking stuff to printers, and there'd be old Christians or something, and they won't print it. Wow! It will happen. It has happened to me. I've had stuff turned down. Just work, you know. You're not asking them. They're just asking them to do to print something. Yeah. So that, and to some extent, with the left wing people, because left wing people are quite suspicious, aren't they? They're a bit suspicious of. Um, Occultism. Yes. Right, let's be honest. 
because uh, they think you're all fascists or something. Yeah, they do. And, the, and the, to be <laughs> there's, there's they're worried a about small that. amount of historical evidence to support such a claim. But it, yeah, yeah um, they are anything that or are you cult recruiting? What are you doing? There's something yeah. that isn't. Part of the Even though there are plenty of occultists who are left wingers as well, well, right? But you can be in them. So they're a bit. But in the end, they were okay about it to sort of win them round to it. Uh, it it was a bit unpleasant because you know you had to. It was almost like going through a process of censorship. But still, it it, it happened. So I learned all that stuff um, and did a little booklet about Oxford called Strange Oxford. And then I had a phone call one day from uh, essentially the wife of Robin Gibb mm -hmm. of the Bee Gees. And they were very interested in, she's a druid, they're interested in that sort of stuff, yeah. basically, without saying too much. I know he's died last year. But they were quite interested in mysteries and, and stuff. So they wanted to do their publishing. Uh, using these facilities, you see, because it's the same thing for them, even though they're m massively rich, some, sometimes it's not always that easy for them to, to do what they want to do. You know, to, it's too mediated, you know, it's too big a deal. It's easier sometimes to go to a small thing. I don't know, okay, we, I went and we went to see that, saw them, and spent some time with them. It was quite, I didn't know who it was, it was a funny <laughs> thing. Just say, oh, come out to the house and. We wanted to, we're just interested in strange Oxford, really. And then sort of Robin Gibb was there and everything. So that's probably the best way, really. You don't know who, who, who it is. It's just it could be anybody. Uh, but anyway, it turned into a... I le so I learned publishing a certain extent, trial and error, with working with them for a little while, doing totally uncommercial... Unsellable things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that nobody was interested in. But we learnt the new technology and stuff like that. Because that was going to be, it, it sort of might be boring for other people, but I'm interested. So you, you have Strange Oxford, and you have uh, this book with the wife of a BG. Yeah. How do you distribute that pre-internet? Where do these things, like, as you say, you have potentially non-commercial inventory. What are you you're going to... Uh, well, it's, you don't, it's very, very hard. Yeah. Very hard to do. Yeah. Uh, it's a really, it's a struggle, and you know, realistically, if it wasn't for the internet, uh, a lot of, of of occult ideas would be really lost. Mm. Yeah, it, you it can do to a certain. I know there were book, more bookshops then, but it's the same now. Bookshops, every bookshop's got a personality running it, mm -hmm. and there's there's often jealousies and factions there. So even in a specialist bookshop, um, they're not always. They might not always be that supportive of what you're doing, yeah. right? So yes. you couldn't. Li you couldn't. You wouldn't live on it. Plus, you know, uh, the type of stuff we're doing is. Um, it's hard, you know, because a, a for, for some reason Crowleyite steel books. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you 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 can go all the trouble to get your book right into a, a shop. And they take the risk on having it in there. And some guy who, or woman who thinks that they're on some sort of magical trip and it's their magical will to steal the book. And you think, <laughs> but yeah, but it just happens to be a, a, my book that you completely <laughs> stole. And as a result of that, I'm not going to get paid and I'm not gonna, they're not going to order anymore either. Because so, it's a, I understand Rogue Side, but it is irritating, that aspect of things. Um, but yeah, no, it was quite it was quite hard work for a while. But um, we did get some stuff distributed, and in America, right? We got we were very lucky that New Leaf found us at a trade fair. And if it wasn't for the American distribution, we'd be we wouldn't probably be doing very well at all. Because mm. re realistically, a lot of the old generation of occult distributors are a bit are a bit hostile. Mm. Uh, a bit obstructive well not not very and they're gone now anyway but you know they have this vision about magic which they've developed from the 1950s or whatever they're kind of and then they don't want to let it go 
They don't want to let the kind of upstarts in, do they? It's always the way. They don't want to let you in. And they may even sabotage you if you're not careful. <laughs> I mean, okay, luckily, I say, they, they always, the existing distributors, uh, new age distributors, always refuse to distribute our stuff. They wouldn't do it. I'm not saying it was any good. You know, the book, the sexual magic book, right? You know, so, but they wouldn't distribute that because of the title. They didn't like that sort of stuff. But I did, knew someone who did a. They went to see the distributor, and the distributor said, oh, we couldn't possibly do it unless you print 3,500 copies, right, which is a huge undertaking for a small yeah, of course. people. It's a big, there's a lot of bread then, mm. uh, and it's a big risk. Uh, you know, why they couldn't have said, well, let's do 500 or something like that. But they said, no, 3,500. So they saved up all this money. Printed three and a half thousand pounds, and then they refused to distribute it. Anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they said they didn't want to do it. Yeah. I said, Well, you know, they could have told them that before they spent all the money. Mm. That's sabotage. That, that is, is sabotage, yeah. I think. Yeah. I think that's an incredibly mean thing to have done. So that's sort of you're up against. So, yes, uh, and you've got shops that are very picky, and they are more expert than you are, and they, they don't want to be whatever. And then some shops, there's that shop in Camden. He was all right. He was a good guy, I thought. I can't think of his name now, but you know what I mean. There used to be Compendium Books. Yeah, it was a left-wing bookshop and you know, a very, very good occult bookshop. Really, really good. Um, and he was very open-minded and quite radical and everything. But then he got busted for drugs. Um and the law on drugs is stupid and uh, especially if you're in business if you're in business and you do drugs and you get caught then they they assume that all your money is coming from selling drugs yeah, they do so then they have to go through which is weird so I must have sold him not very many books but I had to provide evidence for some people to say you know to say that this was legitimate sales not not all of his money was yeah. <laughs> which none of it was anyway it was just a complete fantasy it was very hard so I think that bookshop's gone now so yeah I don't think you, you, there's some books that have been okay but you couldn't I don't think you'd have the occult revival of book selling if, if you relied on booksellers no I think you wouldn't yeah. and the mainstream ones are so make put so many obstacles in the way of small presses and whatever you, they won't, sometimes they won't even list your stuff for customer orders you know so yeah the internet that's uh, it's been good for us I think it's enabled us to bypass all the traditional channels and go direct you know to publicise to be a bit more even you know we can get the message out there and tell people the book exists and uh, get it peer reviewed essentially get it reviewed get people to look at it and at least think about the ideas I and mean, none of that existed before well it did but it was much lower level stuff very hard would you say there's a double edged sword component to it because you're talking about and I, I agree with the idea that it is a double edged sword um it has opened up new avenues for independent publishers of books, but um, in, in that respect, the internet's been good, but it's also, especially in the occult, a wash with garbage. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky. Uh, that wouldn't matter if people... But the problem with occultists is as well, because they're a little bit um, uneducated sometimes, I don't know, or what... Uh, uh, so you need to, re in, it, if you could review things honestly, that would be all right. But then, because everybody knows each other or something, people take reviews very personally. Mm. You know, I know it hurts. It's hurtful if someone, you know, uh, slags you off or slags your book off or says, says whatever. But without that process, you know, that, you can't cut through all of, of that stuff. Anyway, and that is the role of a publisher as well. You know, the publisher is some is some sort of standard, isn't it? Isn't it? You trust in their vision to some extent that the, they think the material is of a reasonable le level. They, and the, so, you, it's partly it's the publisher's vision of what they think is interesting material, and uh, I don't think you're going to replace that. But yeah, I don't know. It needs to be more reviewing, really, or people need to re just. Uh, accept that they might get bad reviews.
and not take it so personally. Yes. Oh no, take it personally, but you just got to accept it. It's better in the end. It's. Um, I've worked, I worked in reviews for three years, mm. so um, like on actual giant review sites where there's a review every half a second and mm. that kind of thing. So, yeah, you, that's potentially something a cold authors can look at. There's there's a sort of ten point sheet about how to deal with less than positive reviews, and I have the um, actual data from small businesses to show that even a negative review results in a sales up. Yeah, so it's still so okay. Don't, yeah, get, get it out there. Have as many people review it. If people think it's a three star book. No need to break out the sort of voodoo dolls and, and mm. go at them. Uh, even even a one star book will um, you'll inevitably be a sales uh, see a sales uplift because the people you might find people who don't like the person who reviewed it go well if he thinks it's one star I'm going to buy her book yeah. and uh, it's it's fascinating but I agree I think uh, I'm hoping that as a next step in terms of a cult discourse that can happen because you're right there's a there's sort of an echo chamber of um, positivity that surrounds certain books. Uh, and maybe not other ones, and other ones just sail right through silently. And you mm. think, well, yeah. So we need more reviewing, and you need that. There's this problem for magazines, isn't there? Really, that's the thing. Mag the cult fanzines and everything. Of, I don't know if they're doing that well or not. No. But they're all a bit cliquey and stuff like that. But. Um, but sometimes the review writing in the, in the magazines is not that good either. No. You know, for one reason or another. It depends on it, on what it is. It's too sycophantic. Where do you think... What do you, what do you hope for magic and magical discourse over the next sort of few years based on <laughs> being involved in it for the last 20? Do you want people to just, like... Do people need to be uh, better educated in terms of academic work? Do they, you know... What's, what's the top There's three? a lot of that happening, isn't there? Mm. Well, I, I think the, we're in a golden age. We're at the beginning nice. of a golden age in terms of uh, discoveries. Uh, and I suppose we occultists to fit it within the process of um, interpretation of that material, really. So you've got a lot of scholarly... I mean, uh, scholarly people doing research that probably we haven't got, we haven't got the time or resources to do, and you, know, you, ha you have to admire some of the work that is done mm. uh, but we can we've got a legitimate role in interpreting and reusing that stuff and I, I think there are lots of new discoveries to be made uh, as far, I know they're in the pipeline and everything so we've got to kind of yeah no, I think we're, we are in a, a right in a I don't know if we're in the beginning of it I hope we're at the yeah I hope we're at the beginning not in the middle or something yeah. <laughs> but there's going to be this big well, see, what's new material to come. What surprises so me? Whole, I want yeah. people to really get into my stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, what surprises me, because I, I, I sincerely hope you're correct, is we're both sort of Egyptophiles. Mm. It's, um, magic seems to... You see people still quoting Budge. I know. And, uh, and what, what surprises me is... Uh, and I know I have... Um, like personal concerns with um, this arbitrary dating of, of everything starting with dynastic Egypt but Egypt itself you, just t taking the New Kingdom alone the last 25 years there's been some amazing stuff and other than the uh, admirable work that you see from sort of Egyptian recreationalist uh, religious times from a magic point of view what, why are we mispronouncing these gods names in Greeks when we've you know People from uh, the Smithsonian have, uh, you know, excavated their temple down to 3000 BC, and we're calling them the wrong thing. Well, that drives me nuts. We're leaving practice on the table. We can go, okay, so, um, I mean, you're going there to look at alignments and the rest of it. There's all this amazing stuff that um, the Golden Dawn was built on cutting-edge history at the time, and it's all mostly wrong now, and yet we're still, that you still have the ghosts of this Victorian vision of history there. What do you think? Comment. Well, I've, yeah, I agree with you. Of course, uh, Crowley is just getting past the corpse of Crowley. Mm. <laughs> Potentially. <Yeah. laughs> the Crow, you know, it, because it, it's a religious thing to some people. Yeah, the, the, the stuff that Crow, which you've got, I suppose you've got to kind of respect that. Um, I mean, even Crowley had to, with his Book of the Law, he got that translated three times. Uh, 
and the first the first one is you know is not so good and it gets more accurate and everything but yeah no, it's the same with Kenneth Grant but uh, all these people they rely on stuff that's yeah it's a bit it does seem a bit superseded but mm. I don't know I guess, I guess it is changing now but you have to you, maybe you do have to leave Crowley behind mm. it's possible so it's to, if you stick with a Crowley thing it's it's such a fantastic as, as it is that's it's almost like you can't revise it. Hmm. You have to you have to stick with that orthodoxy because it's a, it's become a religious thing. It's a question of religious faith now with Crowley that you use those stuff. And for a whole lot of the world, they're kind of only probably just discovering that stuff. Um, See, so the, you probably have to move beyond it. And may, maybe some extent, the Typhonian stuff is move is was a movement. Was a revision, but look at all the trouble that caused. Yeah. Um, the people won't accept even that revision, and that revision itself, as you know, is a bit flawed as well. It's still, you know, and he was just could be quite doctrinaire about people kind of get you know perfecting it a bit or or using saying because it's poetically correct. Is the thing that's the weird thing. They often do point you in the right direction. And that's why you can't completely dispose of it. But, yeah, I think probably you do have to move mm. beyond Crowley. See, I want to come back. Now I potentially understand what you mm. mean by a golden age because I think some of that is happening. And it you, is, isn't it? Yeah, you, people you, are getting new stuff and but also, new like, old stuff. What, what, what I want to see... Yeah. <laughs> well, what, what I want They're to see going the back to five other years, sources. I mean, you would expect this from someone, uh, from a chaos magician, but uh, I don't think the material fits into the shape of an initiatory Masonic-inspired order, and I think that's been the problem with all of them. Mm. But I want to see in the next five years, I want to see Crowley as a folk saint. I want to see him seriously on candles uh, like Santa Muerte. I mm. want this thing to go... Like, I want him to become some kind of weird folk loire. I want yeah. that kind of... Well, like, that would let's be better, just, wouldn't it? Yeah, rather, than, rather than approaching it from this, um, yeah, high Masonic... Um, yeah, a religious approach where people are sort of going, well, let's just sort of tinker around the edges of the different subjects for the different grades. No, let's put him on a candle. Mm, yeah, <laughs> and, we'll be on it. And, uh, and let's do that kind of really matter stuff because there's, there's, there's great material in things like the Book of the Law and he, he undoubtedly says good stuff, but I don't think, and I think history has shown, I don't think the next step is to moderately change... Uh, a Masonic shape because I don't think the material fits in it. That's true. Although I say even in Crowley, I say there's, there is this Islamic stuff, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Which uh, even in the kind of his version of the rituals, or I'm not sure whose version is which. Really, I say I never know what. It say that hexagram ritual. You've got is it the hexagram? Yeah, you've got bits of Arabic in there. In quite a lot of the rituals, there are odd bits of Sufi phrases in Arabic and stuff. So he, it is, it is kind of funny that he he knew that stuff, and I think that is that is a neglected resource, really. That, that you know, which I've been using to kind of um, that leads you back into the Egyptian material mm. because it is a con- there's a continuity there. It's difficult to know that these days when Islam is such a so difficult, isn't it? It's very difficult in the world now to think to want to go near that stuff because of this sort of fundamentalist stuff we're getting. But you go back to the you know the sources that we've all, that we probably all use the sources of the grimoires, the Arabic uh, translations and versions of them. That was interfaith. They, they their sources are. Jewish, Christian, and Islamic in one in a magical document they're using the same, so that that's the that and that's the same magical headspace that you had in the classical world where they were combining Hebrew or uh, Greek and uh, Egyptian sources. So the beginning of a, of uh, Islamic magic is very fluid, and it's it's, it's, it's exactly what we want. Oh, uh, so. You know, you've got to give some. 
something to Crowley is saying that he recognised that and it's there, right? But people probably see these funny bits of writing and think, oh, what's that? Or Ararita and everything and realise that's a Sufi mantra and things. So the clues are there. But, um, but on the whole, yeah, I think, I think if, if you do the, if you allow the revision to take place uh, based on the better sources, then I think the magic will actually work better. Yeah. Realistically. If you get the names, it's not the names, but if you get the kind of the system correct, rather than, because Crowley had a tendency to correct the Egyptian system, didn't he, yeah, right? He, did. he was always saying, oh, they must else. have meant this, this way, I'll fit it into this fourfold elemental system and all, whatever it might have been, and make this. Which, all right, is a very interesting thing, but if you, if you undo that, um, there's a mystery to that. Also, say for instance in the Liber Samech, it takes the name Moses out and he puts um, Ankafna Konsu. Who's <laughs> who the fuck is that? Yeah. Moses. You know, Moses is a very, very interesting figure within classical magic. I don't mean ancient biblical magic. I mean at the time that these things were. It's, it's quite an important myth figure, uh, and to miss that connection out. And for the person not to be able to say I am Moses uh, in that ritual and to realise what, what they're talking about why, why that was such an important thing at the time it, 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 gives, it gives it more power I, I, you just picked one of the things that I certainly do myself I, I couldn't agree more one, I don't know when your love of Egypt started but for me it's contemporaneous to finding Crowley mm -hmm. and if you've ever had the experience of trying as a kid to go and find all this bullshit that he's talking about <laughs> like, <laughs> like, concept, like in actual Egyptology going wow this is all garbage <laughs> everything he's been saying but I agree with Moses in particular I mean clearly wasn't an historical figure but uh, because you had Manu and, and previous lawgivers but that's the whole point there is this uh, mythic character to say you are Moses or you are Manu. I mean, Hermes Trismegistus was considered a contemporary of him, and neither of these people existed, and it's not the point. The point is that says something about that role and that myth, and you do need to be able to say you are that. You are the... Th um, uh, you need to adopt the mantle of that intermediary between the highest and, and, and the... Uh, uh, and the earth realm, which is what Moses and Manu and Hermes Trismegistus and whatever were. So I agree completely. You do mm. need to kind of peel back quite a bit of his bullshittery. And, uh... and you know, it'll still be something there. They're still, you're still looking at the right place. I mean, we don't know, that's that, we've talked about it before. Why, why, if he was so into Ankafna Konsu, why did you go and look for him then? You know, you could have found a little bit more about him. He never actually went to, uh, to Thebes to look so. He only stayed in Cairo, so it was almost like he didn't even follow through on his own yeah, wordplay. Why do you think that? Do you think it's because? Do you think it's because he knew he wouldn't find it? No, but I think he would have found it. Do you, okay. I think he would have found something. He would, I, 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 he's there, right? There yeah. are remains of Van Kafner Konsu, okay. as they've said on the uh, Paul has said on Lashtal uh, quite rightly, his graffiti. I mean, I don't know if you realised that when we were at the, if you were at that Treadwell's talk we did on for the celebration of the Book of the Law, and Paul was there, and he talked about Aunt Kafna Konsu, and he said, "Oh, we we know quite a lot about him. We even know his shoe size, right? Which is a sort of throwaway, but in fact, we do. You do actually know his shoe size. It's true, it's completely true, because on top of the Temple of Konsu at Karnak is a piece of graffiti written by." And Kafna Konsu, which is the outline of his foot. That's weird. So it's actually, and then all the other priests are there as well. So amongst about 150 pieces of graffiti, so and people, right. which is they put their feet there, mark their feet out, and they say, I'm and Kafna Konsu, blah, blah, blah. So we might have, you know, the footsteps of the master, he might have actually quite liked to have done that. Mm -hmm. If it had just been Ankaf Nakonsu, I would have completely changed my tone and said, yes, Crowley is definitely him. <laughs> because that's you a probably very should Crowley have followed up on him, really. Or, as I say, there, there's the whole thing about the Typhonian... The hidden... The thing is, you know, about the hidden god, right? There seems to be this undertow in all the magical stuff of the last hundred years that everybody's been struggling towards. Is the hidden god. That's, that's, we, that's what they think people Crowley is really getting at and all these other systems seem to be moving towards it 
which is not whoever it is, AWAS and all this mm. sort of stuff, although there may well be them as well. It's set. That is probably, well, from a magical point of view, one of the most ma- interesting magical currents in, in Egypt. It's an incredibly important one for the cult community to connect with. It's almost like it's been struggling from all these different places to connect with that and to, to remember that. So would you say that's something you'd like to see? Uh, w- would that be a positive change in magical discourse to, to have other um, areas of magic look at set? Well, everybody's doing it now anyway, aren't they? Yeah. It's happening. You can't, can't avoid it. Everybody suddenly... I mean, no, I say there's quite a lot of probably... No, there's quite a lot of good material there. And there's a, lot, there's a certain amount of bullshit material as well, where it's the same again, really. They're just sort of recasting it, trying to be amazingly sinister and stuff. But yeah, there's obviously a mystery that wants to manifest itself mm. and was very connected with the... In the Corpus Hermeticum, it's, there's this sort of prophecy, which is, I kind of think is, that, is for us, for everybody, saying that, that, that it's the end of Egypt at that point, which it was, you know, the, the, the temples are going to fall into disuse and people are going to forget the, this language and forget all about those people for a long time. Uh, and, you know, ignorant people are going to come along and who won't really understand anything. But then it said, but there, it's going to rise again. At some point, in the, and it says in the West, but whether it means us, I don't know, but certainly it's going to rise again at some point in the future. Uh, and that prophecy is sort of connected as well with the mythology of Horus and Set. Because mm. those, those are the two parties in this sort of dispute between order and chaos if you like, at the, at that's happening at, and, and at, at that time in the world, that's how people, that's how the magical people, most advanced people saw it there's this, this struggle between uh, civilization and barbarism in a way or ignorance and um, I mean, alright, that might be too extreme right? but in a way, there's probably, that's how they saw it, there's the civilization and the knowledge of, the ancient knowledge of the past and there's this force of uh, people who don't really read books. Mm. Yeah, they are. Their books are not. They're, they're not interested in those ideas. They don't even like the hieroglyphs anymore. You know, they're going to abandon all of that. So they could see that there's this t- tremendous struggle between magic, which is the force of, and the force of ignorance, and they, it's often posed as this struggle between you know people, gods like. Horus and Set, but it's going to re-emerge at some point in the future. It has to. So we're fulfilling that prophecy. I think that's what the magical community is doing. But it has to know something about the prophecy before it can <laughs> do that. Yeah. It has to know something about this sort of thing, this karma laid on them mm-hmm. by the past, and it has to remember those people. It has to remember that our ancestors in Egypt correctly. That's part of the reason of the research. I think. Is that it's not just about being um, east, you know, the land of Eastern promise and esotericism, and just because it's exotic, which is how Egypt has been received up till now. It's, it's exotic. It's not really the wisdom of Egypt. That's we're, we're kind of people probably have said, oh, well, that doesn't really exist. It's the it, that's a, some plus propaganda. But it isn't propaganda. I see that there is, there is such a thing as the wisdom of Egypt that wants, but and there are people there, our ancestors, that we um, probably it, it wouldn't do us any well. It's the good thing for us to connect with them. That's where our knowledge is going to come from. And people have been trying to do that for the, since the 1875 or whatever the Theosophical Society uh, gradually been moving in that direction. So I think that's what's going to happen next. Hmm. That you reach a point where um, you're aware of, and I, I think about people like um, Giordano Bruno, who the theatre of memory. But he, I love that he was using uh, hermetic material, and it was working, and he knew it was um, old, and it was in some way kind of like um, the legacy and birthright of all mankind. And even though no one could read hieroglyphs or anything at the time, he he said here in Oxford. Um, he, had, he had to use Hermes Trismegistus as his authority, saying this really smart guy 
said these things, but it's the story of this place and, and it's um, uh, hermetic wisdom's gone in and out largely thanks to a hit piece paid for by King James I, but uh, it's gone in and out of um, being a repository, a repository of Egyptian wisdom and, well, initially it was the only way back into it because it was written in Greek in the 4th century, no questions. Uh, and then it... Yeah, but it's written in a time of crisis. Uh, it, do you know what it so is? So it's special. It's a special book. It's not... The, the the thing about people think oh they've heard oh that it's being debunked and everything rubbish, but there's rubbish. but its actual date of composition is actually very very significant. I, it means it's it's right on the money. It's it's a time when people know they're under threat. And they I get the they, impression from it that it is like um, scooping up all the silverware when you know that uh, like during a revolution when you know the uh, the peasants yeah. are at the gate and you scoop up all the silverware you pack it into whatever you've got and you flee through the back door exactly and I think that's a good way of putting it the, the Hermetica is a a hurried compilation of um, this as you were saying this magic of Egypt because it, it you need to there's no neat packing this stuff you don't no. need 20 you can't have someone go through a 20 year course you need to throw it all in a bag and run yeah. run for the train yeah. uh, and that uh, and that's, it's, it's interesting that it was that awareness should have happened again, but we're still suffering the uh, uh, from the hit piece that King James the First literally paid for to say it's all late Greek crap, um, it's garbage, it has nothing to do with Egypt. Uh, that, as kind of as I was saying downstairs, the last hundred years of um, Egyptological research has sort of borne out some very significant. Um, it's shown that it's all Egyptian. Yeah, it is. well, it is. The, the sky ground dualism is there from the beginning of dynastic Egypt. And, and sure, they're using different words and different names for it. That's not the point. The, it's because they've hired So you've got to follow the together. lead. That's right. So you follow the lead of that text, which is a summary, but then go back into the Egyptian yeah. material, which is being, is being dug out now, or to, to interpret. Is there, is, that's, that's what it's asking. It can't possibly have put it all in one book. It's put some essence stuff in it. Yeah. But it's pointing us in the right direction. And we should, yeah, we should go with it. That's a good spot to end. Ha ha. We better have a beer then. I think so. <laughs> that was it.